Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Rodney Peterson, and I'm on the board of directors of the Internet Education Foundation. And I once again want to welcome you to the annual State of the Net Conference. I'm pleased to introduce the next session, a keynote discussion with Leslie Caldwell, who is an assistant attorney general and head of the criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice. The moderator for this session will be Andrew Gross, a reporter in the Wall Street Journal's Washington Bureau covering law enforcement. Please join me in welcoming Assistant Attorney General Caldwell and Andrew Grossman for this keynote discussion and their perspectives on the state of the net. So, thanks a lot for taking the time to do this. Um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on uh, Leslie's background. Uh, this is actually her second tour at the Justice Department. Um, the first time around, she spent 16 years as a federal prosecutor. She led prosecutions uh, of everyone from gangsters in Brooklyn to Medicare fraudsters in San Francisco. Uh, and then after the collapse of Enron, she directed the task force that brought charges against top executives there. And after that, she spent 10 years on the other side of the table, largely doing white collar work. Uh, she was confirmed as the head of the Justice Department's criminal division in May, so that puts her at the center of the department's decision making on what sorts of cases it'll prioritize and how it'll go about making those cases. Mm. So my plan here is to um, start by giving you a chance to give a broad overview of your approach to cyber issues. Uh, then I thought we'd delve into some of the administration's legislative proposals in this area, and then we'll move on to enforcement and talk a little bit about specific threats and how the department's grappling with them. So obviously, uh, computer crime, cyber issues, are a much greater concern uh, this time around uh, than they were when you left government in 2004. Uh, I think on your first or second day in the new job, you announced, uh, first day, announced uh, a takedown of the Game Over Zoo spotnet. So I'm curious, in those uh, seven months so far, um, what priorities have you tried to set for the Justice Department uh, on cybercrime, and what are the challenges and obstacles uh, you've encountered? So you're right that cybercrime is a huge problem now that was a much smaller problem when I was in the department before and left in 2004. Uh, it's really something that cuts across all criminal conduct. Um, it's not just hackers. It's not just intellectual property thieves. It's organized crime. It's international organized crime. It's narcotics trafficking. Uh, cyber is really in every kind of crime now, and we expect that to just grow and mushroom. Um, there are a lot of challenges in addressing cybercrime. Um, probably the biggest challenge is that it's very international. A lot of the, the criminal actors are not in the United States, but they're committing crimes either in the United States over the internet or crimes that affect the United States. Um, in the game over Zeus botnet that you mentioned, uh, a botnet being run out of Russia and Eastern Europe was literally affecting hundreds of thousands of computers in the United States and stealing millions and millions of dollars from US companies and bank accounts. So that's a real challenge. Uh, uh, attribution of cyber attacks is a real challenge. Um, and another really significant challenge that we see is the increasing anonymization of cyber attacks. But the biggest challenge is, I think, is to have the resources to keep pace with changes in technology and with the ever-increasing sophistication levels of cyber criminals. Uh, and I want to get back definitely to some of the anonymization issues, um, but I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, the law and in some cases, the Justice Department's use of it has been a target of criticism from people who pay attention to these issues. I think uh, Tim Wu at Columbia called it uh, the worst law in technology. Uh, there have been a number of changes, proposed changes, and including one this month from the administration. Can you just sort of walk us through uh, what you're proposing there and uh, what you'd like to see? So what we're really proposing are um, very targeted changes to the law. The law was enacted years ago. Technology's changed very substantially since then. The law has not kept pace. So we have some very targeted things that we'd like to see happen. I'll just give you some examples. I'm not going to give you a survey of all the changes. But for example, it's not currently clear that it's illegal to sell a botnet. It's illegal to create one. It's illegal to use a botnet in connection with criminal activity. But it's not clear that it's illegal to sell one. Um, so we've proposed that that be made clearly illegal to sell a botnet um, for criminal purposes. Uh, not just to sell any botnet for any purpose, but really for criminal purposes. Um, right now, we, we very successfully have used civil injunctions to stop botnets and to disable them. Um, but we're currently only able to do that if the botnet is engaged in fraud and some other certain activities. If the botnet is engaged in denial of service attacks, we, we can't use our civil injunction powers to, to interrupt the botnet. And we'd like to change that as well. 
Um, we currently are not, are not able to, um, spyware is currently illegal if it's used for criminal purposes to intercept private communications, but we're not currently able to forfeit the proceeds of sale of spyware. And that's a change that we would like to see happen as well because a lot of spyware may be being sold in the United States, but the people who are creating the spyware and, and marketing it may well be located in a place where we have no ability to actually prosecute them. But we'd like to be able to hit them in the pocketbook where it hurts. So those are some examples of some changes. There are others, but those are some examples. What, one change that I think has raised some eyebrows is uh, an increase in the penalties uh, under, uh, for, for certain violations of the CFAA. Uh, there's a place where minimum penalties uh, would go from a one-year misdemeanor to, to uh, three year, a three-year felony, and then up to a, uh, the maximum would go from a five-year fel felony to a 10-year felony. Why, I mean, is, is it five years not a big enough uh, hammer for these sorts of cases to hang over people's head? So under the federal sentencing system, um, the maximum sentence is really, it's a little bit misleading what sentence a person will actually get because you have to know that there are sentencing guidelines. And the sentencing guidelines are tailored to the specifics of the criminal conduct. So in a case where a statutory maximum might be 10 years, that doesn't mean that the person is going to or even could get 10 years because the federal judge who's going to be imposing the sentence needs to look at the guidelines and see the seriousness of the offense. Uh, was it a large organized offense? Was the person a leader? Um, were there multiple people involved? There are all sorts of factors that a judge will consider in deciding where within the guidelines range to sentence a person. Um, the, the increased penalties are really to reflect the increased seriousness of the kinds of attacks we've seen. So these are really for the most serious offenders. And, and it was our feeling that as the attacks have grown in seriousness and scope, um, some of these attacks are extremely serious, involve very large amounts of money, and lar very large disruptions of, of people's privacy and their lives. And the most serious offenders should be subjected to more serious potential penalties. Uh, one of the uh, criticisms of the CFA, CFAA deals with this issue of exceeding authorized access uh, and these prosecutions for uh, violating terms of service or potential prosecutions for violating terms of service. Your proposal makes some changes to that area of the law. Some in Congress want to go a little further and specifically uh, exclude violations of terms of service from the CFAA. Uh, is that a bad idea or why is your idea, uh, the administration's idea, better there? So I think the, con the, pro the proposal that you're talking about in Congress goes a little too far because I think there are circumstances where violations of terms of service can be very serious. Uh, we have no interest in prosecuting somebody who goes on to a dating website and lies about their, their attractiveness or their income in violation of the terms of service of the dating website. Um, and that's, I'm being a little glib there, but we really have no interest in prosecuting. And that was, Judge Kaczynski mentioned that in... Yes. Um, but, that, but those are not the kind of cases that we're interested in. Um, but there are circumstances where somebody who is authorized to have access, for example, a law enforcement officer, is authorized to have access to a computer but abuses that access to, say, gather information about personal enemies and use that information against those personal enemies or to run the, the criminal history of uh, an ex-wife's boyfriend or a lot of inappropriate things that really should not be allowed. Um, and so there needs to be some way to address violations of terms of access in a criminal way when that's appropriate. But as I said, we're not interested in insignificant things. So our proposal has, um, we have three circumstances where it would be a violation, where it would be a criminal violation. If information is taken from um, a source that is worth more than $5,000, that would be a crime. If the violation of terms of access is in, is in furtherance of another felony, that would be a crime. And if the person, to use the example I cited earlier about the law enforcement officer, is using a government computer in violation of terms of service. So we think that's a good compromise that, that criminalizes the things that, um, that are dangerous uh, without criminalizing things like the dating website. Uh, and you've also uh, proposed criminalizing trafficking in uh, means of access. Uh, there's some worry out there that this could be used to go after researchers, uh, academics, journalists, so on. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that provision? Sure. So that, our proposal is really, it's not, it's, it's only really targeted at people who um, are intending to commit a crime. 
So it can't, it's not just somebody who's doing legitimate security research um, to, to find a flaw in a system or something like that. It's really just somebody whose intent is to engage in criminal activity. Um, so that's, that's really what we're targeting, and that's very different from targeting uh, legitimate research, security researchers. We understand the importance of security researchers. We work with security researchers all the time. We, we value their skills, and we appreciate their expertise, and we, and we understand the importance of what they do. Um, this is not targeted at them. I mean, I think there's some concern there about where the line is, and you know, where, where you know, there are people who call themselves a, maybe an online troll, uh, but there's not a, you know, they're not affiliated with a particular institution. Uh, how can, I mean, should those people feel safe? I think if they're not intending to commit a crime, they should feel safe. But if they are intending to commit a crime, um, and I, I, I understand what you're saying about the, the line um, not being completely clear, but there is, we do exercise prosecutorial discretion all the time in deciding where, where we should and should not prosecute. I think if the person is intending to commit a crime or they do engage in criminal activity, um, there have been circumstances where people have, in the name of research, um, taken and exposed large amounts of um, private information from individuals, which we think is inappropriate. Um, so, but we really are focused on criminal activity. Uh, let's shift a little bit and talk about some of the anonymity tools you mentioned earlier, uh, such as TOR. Uh, my conversations with people in law enforcement, um, it seems like prosecutors, the FBI, have become increasingly confident in their ability to, if not crack TOR, to get around it, to <coughs> exploit the mistakes that are being made by the targets of investigations. Uh, in November, you announced, uh, along with some European law enforcement, a takedown of uh, some dark market sites that uh, operated on the TOR network. Uh, I believe there were some arrests uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, how big of a problem is TOR still for uh, law enforcement? So TOR obviously was created with good intention, but um, it, is, it is a huge problem for law enforcement. Um, there are a lot of, as you mentioned from our takedown last fall, there are a lot of online um, supermarkets where you can do anything from purchase heroin to buy guns to hire somebody to kill somebody. Um, there are murder for hire sites. Uh, we, we understand that something like 80% of the traffic on the TOR network is, uh, involves child exploitation and pornography sites, child pornography. Um, so that's a significant problem. We have made some advances in our ability to penetrate the TOR network, um, and that has resulted in some cases, but uh, it's, still, it's still a real challenge. Um, there's a lot of, again, this goes back to my point earlier about how internationaliz internationalization of the internet, uh, well, I guess not internationalization of the internet, but the fact that the internet is so international is a huge challenge. And when you add in the tour network, that makes it even more of a challenge because a person may be sitting in Romania uh, engaging in some child exploitation activity that is making its way to the United States. And it's very difficult to locate those people. It's even more difficult to find them and actually bring them to justice. So, it is a very significant tool of, of cyber criminals. In terms of your ability to, to bring cases, you know, when you want to take down a certain network, is it that in some cases it's, it's completely impossible or it just takes longer or you know, there's, there's more international coordination? I mean, how, you know, looking back at your time doing sort of real world or, or uh, offline world gangs, uh, those cases obviously took a long time and had big challenges too. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is there a large, large gap there, or, or is it just a different set of uh, skills that, that uh, government and the FBI has to learn? So I would say it's both. Um, I mean, traditional law enforcement skills definitely play into cyber investigations. Um, we use undercovers, we use informants, um, we use wiretaps. Um, but it's different because if you're investigating a gang, you'll generally know that the gang is in Brooklyn or the gang is in Queens, or the gang is in Washington, D.C., and you'll generally know who the gang members are, and you're, you'll generally know a fair amount about them and be able to figure out a lot about their backgrounds and their histories, and you'll be able to identify the crimes they're committing. And the crimes will generally be relatively localized, maybe even if they're all over the United States, it's still, you can still know where they are. In the cyber world, it can be very challenging to even figure out who are these people. There are a lot of loose networks of people who may band together 
uh, for example, to engage in one hack, uh, say a hack of a retailer, and then sell the stolen information and the stolen credit cards at Carter forums online. Then there may be another hack where some combination of those same people are involved, but other people are involved. And they're all over the world. Um, they may be sitting in one country and using servers that are in another country uh, where the victims are in a third country and then the money's flowing back to a fourth country. So it can be extremely challenging to identify people, to link them together, to trace the money. It's, it's a very challenging thing. It's, it's significantly more challenging and requires different skills in addition to the traditional law enforcement skills than you would need to investigate an organized crime gang in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a similar vein, uh, Bitcoin and, and virtual currencies, uh, over the last few years the department's made uh, some major cases targeting virtual currency businesses. Uh, it seems like a primary worry here is that it's a money, money laundering tool. Uh, have prosecutions, get, like the case against uh, Charlie Schrem, who pleaded guilty to helping users anonymously exchange cash for Bitcoin, uh, has that chilled illicit Bitcoin activity? Um. Unfortunately, I don't think it has. Um, I think Bitcoin is still viewed by criminals as a way to mask um, their transactions. I mean, it's difficult for us because there's no central place where Bitcoin is located. It's difficult for us to trace. And obviously, Bitcoin is perfectly legal and, and, and may well have a place as it evolves and the markets evolve going forward uh, in commerce, e-commerce in particular. But uh, it does pose a challenge for us because it can definitely be used to conceal illegal activity and it's more difficult for us to trace uh, transactions that are being done in Bitcoin. And, and one of the things we need to do is we need to upgrade our money, anti-money laundering laws to recognize the reality that there are these virtual currencies out there that are different than what we've been used to and what those laws were intended to address. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you feel like you're starting to get, you know, Close. I mean, obviously, it's, it's much newer uh, than the traditional banking system, but do you feel like you're starting to get some sort of handle on, you know, how these operate? Uh, and, you know, you're still making plenty of cases uh, against banks for money laundering in dollars and pesos. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but we certainly have a lot of people in our computer crime and intellectual property section who know a lot about Bitcoin and, and FBI agents who know a lot about Bitcoin and Secret Service agents. And they're certainly, they understand the market, they understand um, the, the whole Bitcoin and virtual currency space. Um, so I think we're certainly, we may be playing a little bit of catch up, but we're certainly getting it. Mm -hmm. uh, law enforcement, unfortunately, tends to follow a little bit behind the criminals, um, pretty much across the board, ranging from organized crime to cyber crime. So should we be on the lookout for uh, more cases uh, involving uh, Bitcoin businesses and uh, the Bitcoin in Bitcoin infrastructure? I don't know that we're necessarily focusing on the Bitcoin uh, infrastructure. I think we're more fo focused on criminal activity um, where the criminals choose to have payment made in Bitcoin. So for example, we, as part of the game over Zeus takedown, we also took down um, a ransomware where the, um, it was called Crypto Locker, where people's screens would be frozen they would be told that their files were all um, locked and to get access to their files they had to pay a ransom and that ransom had to be paid in Bitcoin. So it wasn't the Bitcoin so much that was the problem, it was the, the ransom and the, and the locking of the files. Uh, you mentioned CryptoLocker. Uh, it seems like there's something happening here uh, with CryptoLocker on one end and maybe Sony on the other uh, where we're seeing uh, cybercrime going from theft of data to uh, into more and more extortion, you know, uh, hacking to try to get people to, to give money, to change their behavior. Um, is that something that you're worried about? I think extortion over the internet has, has, has a long history. Um, it may be getting more sophisticated, but I think that um, it's not a new problem. I think it's, it's, it's been a problem for quite some time, and it may be growing in sophistication and, and breadth as we see so many of our internet cyber crimes growing, but I don't think it's a new problem. Mm -hmm. um, let's get your perspective on the moves by some phone makers to uh, encrypt locked phones uh, so, so law enforcement can't get into them. Uh, I've seen the FBI director weigh in on this, the British Prime Minister. Um, I'd love to get your view there. And President Obama. Um, 
So we're very concerned about that. Um, we understand the value of encryption. Uh, we understand the importance of security. But we're also very concerned that, that, that there not be the creation of really what I would call a zone of lawlessness, uh, where there's evidence that we could have um, lawful access to through a court order that we're prohibited from getting because of a company's technological choices. Um, we, have see, we do have cases where evidence that's on f phones is extremely important, um, and those tend to be cases involving violent crime, uh, rape, murder, kidnapping, where for some reason the criminals have a tendency to videotape what they're doing and take pictures. Um, and to the extent that we're not able to get access to that kind of evidence, that, that can be a very significant obstacle to us being able to successfully prosecute those cr kinds of crimes. And the kind of access we, we would seek is the kind of access we had in the prior version of, for example, the iPhone, where we would get a search warrant from a court w after showing probable cause, and we would send the phone to Apple, and Apple would do the unlocking of the phone and send us the, the portions that were relevant to our investigation. So it's not as if we're, we're seeking open access without any court supervision to this data, but we really think it's important that we have access, lawful access, to evidence that can be extremely important in solving crimes. Is there a way to, to for, for, for Apple, Google, to, to let you guys in, uh, but keep out uh, authoritarian governments, or say no to, to authoritarian governments, uh, and, and others that um, they might not want to do business with in that regard? So I don't actually. I'm not going to speak to whether Apple's able to say no to the Chinese government, for example, but in other areas of law enforcement, we don't, our rules and our evidence, our access to evidence are not dependent on what China would want to do or what the law might be in China. Here in the United States, we have a process whereby we can get this electronic evidence through search warrants and court orders. Um, and it shouldn't matter, from my vantage point, it shouldn't matter that China may not have that same robust process. Right. Um, so I think we're just about uh, out of time, but uh, I wanted to end with the question I usually ask at the end, end, of, inter end of interviews. Um, what else should we be on the lookout for over, over the next year? I mean, what, what are the uh, new expanding frontiers where we should expect cases? Uh, what, what are people not looking at or, or not seeing that, that um, you think is, is especially important and, and we should keep an eye out for? So I think um, we really need everyone in the country, both personal individuals and companies and organizations really need to be more conscious of cybersecurity. I think everyone needs to really be assuming that they are vulnerable, assuming that they can be hacked, assuming that their data can be taken, um, and needs to plan accordingly. And we recently created a new cybersecurity unit within our computer crime and intellectual property section to try to increase public awareness uh, on prevention. Because I think that that's where we really need to go. Um, we're not going to be able to prevent every cyber attack, but um, maybe those of you in this audience are sophisticated and probably know much more than I do about this, but I find myself surprised by how flat-footed and unprepared some very large and sophisticated companies are, um, including companies that you would think would have state-of-the-art cybersecurity. So I think that's really where we need to go because I don't think um, the hackers are not going to stop. The people who are getting their 15 minutes of fame through these big hacks are being um, reinforced by the 15 minutes of fame, not to mention the, the money that they're making from stealing all this information. So I really think that prevention uh, and an emphasis on prevention is something that we really, really need to focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like maybe we still got a little more time. Um, you mentioned uh, international uh, efforts earlier, and you know you've seen uh, cases that you've brought, uh, you or, or the National Security Division have brought, um, say, against the uh, PLA hackers, uh, or um, there have been uh, there's a large the large RICO case where you have a lot of the defendants still overseas. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about um, you know and, and some of the, the the criticism of those cases is well these people are never going to be uh, see a U.S. inside of a U.S. courtroom. Um, how are is the department working to change that or or um, make those people uh, change those people's behavior in places that we can't get to? So I think that the, the idea that what's the point of indicting somebody in Russia because you'll never get them is, is really wrong. Um, 
we have the ability to, it's true that we won't be able to get Russia to arrest and extradite a Russian citizen to the United States, but if that person travels somewhere, uh, we have capability through international law enforcement to have alerts, um, and we often do get people who travel, and I don't mean to single out Russia, but there are any number of countries. Um, when people travel internationally, we have many, many cases where people have, have traveled and where we have successfully arrested them and extradited them to the United States. Um, there are, there's a large case right now in, uh, pending in Seattle um, involving a Russian national named Seleznev who was traveling in the Maldives and was arrested and, and brought to the United States. So we do get people who travel, and it's not uncommon for people to, to travel in different parts of the world. They might not come to the United States, but they may not realize that by going to the Maldives, they make themselves vulnerable to arrest. Um, I think there's also pressure, uh, increasing pressure on local governments. Um, for example, if there's a Russian hacker who's, hack, who's hacking computers in the United States, but who's also doing things in Russia, the Russian government may not be that happy about that. And again, I don't mean to single out Russia, but I think the same thing is true in a lot of countries where um, these countries' citizens are becoming victims also, and they don't want that. So I think there's increasing international pressure. There's increasing international cooperation uh, among law enforcement, including in countries that you may not think would be part of that mix. So that's really what we're doing, and I, I think it's only a matter of time before almost all the countries in, in the world realize that this is in nobody's interest to protect these people. All right, well, thank you for doing thank this. Thank you, my pleasure.